Self. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Justin Burke. Originally from New Jersey, Dr. Burke studied at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where he completed a joint Master of Arts degree in both moral philosophy and the history of art. He was subsequently a doctoral candidate at Oriel College in Oxford, England, where he undertook research on the philosopher Hegel. The degree of Doctor of Philosophy was conferred upon him by the University of Oxford in 1999 for his dissertation on Hegel's aesthetics. His topic today is appropriately titled, Everything You Know About Hegel is Wrong. But first we'll have the reading followed by the lecture. Today's reading is from The Fixation of Belief by C.S. Peirce. The force of habit will sometimes cause a man to hold on to old beliefs. After he is in a condition to see that they have no sound basis. But reflection upon the state of the case will overcome these habits. And he ought to allow reflection its full weight. People sometimes shrink from doing this having an idea that beliefs are wholesome, which they cannot help feeling, rest on nothing. But let such persons suppose an analogous, though different, case from their own. Let them ask themselves what they would say to a reformed Muslim who should hesitate to give up his old notions in regard to the relations of the sexes, or to a reformed Catholic who should still shrink from reading the Bible. Would they not say that these persons ought to consider the matter fully and clearly understand the new doctrine and then ought to embrace it in its entirety? But above all, let it be considered that what is more wholesome than any particular belief is integrity of belief and that to avoid looking into the support of any belief from fear that it may turn out rotten is quite as immoral as it is disadvantageous. The person who confesses that there is such a thing as truth, which is distinguished from falsehood simply by this, that if acted on it, should, on full consideration, carry us to the point we aim at and not astray. And then, though convinced of this, dares not to know the truth and seeks to avoid it, is in a sorry state of mind indeed. Dr. Burke. Thank you, Jersey, for that introduction and that reading. Greetings, thinkers. You all know who Goethe was, right? Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the famous poet, the playwright, the polymath. His novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther, made him an overnight sensation at the age of 25. He was also a talented artist and a lifelong scientific researcher. And I want to start by reading a description of an experiment he carried out on his daughter-in-law, one afternoon in the autumn of 1827. One day, Goethe announced there would be a guest for lunch without saying his name or introducing him as he made his appearance. During the meal, Goethe was comparatively quiet, no doubt so as not to disturb the free speech of his very voluble and logically penetrating guest, who elaborated upon himself in oddly complicated grammatical forms, an entirely novel terminology, a mode of expressing mentally overleaping itself, the peculiarly employed philosophical formulations of the ever more animated man in the course of his demonstrations finally reduced Goethe to silence. Later, after the table had been cleared and the guest departed, Goethe asked, Now how did you like the man? Strange, she replied, he did not seem to be a clear thinker. I cannot tell whether he is brilliant or mad. Goethe laughed ironically, Well, well, my dear, for your information, we have just now dined with the most famous of modern philosophers, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. As this story suggests, a single afternoon spent in the company of Professor Hegel himself was insufficient to gain any significant understanding of what he said or thought. And as so many of the books purporting to be about his philosophy equally attest, it is possible for one to emerge from many years of study not much better informed. In fact, to quote the rather presumptuous title of today's talk, everything that you know about Hegel may in fact be wrong. Why is this? Well, what do we know about Hegel? Uh, are there any Hegelians present? Any anti-Hegelians? 
thought I'd check. Uh, is there anyone who's read anything about Hegel? I know, I know Jersey has. Jersey, I think, has more Hegel books than I have. Uh, does anyone know how many books Hegel actually wrote? Famous philosopher, must be a lot, right? Uh, would it surprise you if I told you it was only two? That's right, Hegel published only two books in his lifetime, The Phenomenology of Mind, and later his second and last book, The Science of Logic. I guess that's more books than Socrates wrote, but not many compared to someone like Kant or Nietzsche. So how then do we account for Hegel's complete works currently numbering 28 volumes with 11 more still in preparation at the Hegel Archive in Germany today? In fact, Hegel's complete works have been issued in six separate editions, which is an extraordinary number for a single philosopher. For comparison, there's only one edition of the complete writings of Immanuel Kant. So what is in all those Hegel volumes? In addition to the phenomenology of mind and the science of logic, Hegel also published two textbooks to be used alongside his lecture courses. Those were the philosophy of right, his political theory, and something called the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences. This outlines his entire system of philosophy. These, however, were simply numbered paragraphs and not standalone books that could have been read independently. They're still in print, but the editions we read today are double or triple their original size from the addition of supplemental material. So how do books get bigger over time? How do they emerge from nowhere? all those other volumes? The answer, unfortunately, is related to Hegel's sudden and unexpected death during an outbreak of cholera in November 1831, right in the middle of the fall term, during which he was teaching his course on, log on logic at the University of Berlin. Because he died prematurely, Hegel did not get a chance to edit or publish any of the material that he had amassed over so many years of lecturing. This editing had to be done later by the various committees of editors of all those editions of Hegel's complete works, the first of which convened in 1832, calling itself the Association of the Friends of the Departed. This group undertook the work free of charge for the benefit of Hegel's wife and his two teenage sons. One of those books uh, in the first edition, I have uh, one of them here, was Hegel's Aesthetics, uh, the, the book that I studied as a researcher. Uh, now, Hegel, of course, did not write a book called Hegel's Aesthetics, that wouldn't make much sense. But one with, that's apparently what it's called here on the, on the cover. When I see this, I would think a book called Hegel's Aesthetics would be about Hegel's Aesthetics rather than containing it. But what isn't obvious from this cover is that it isn't even a real book. Instead, it's nearly, there are actually two of them. This is 1,300 pages of material collected from different periods of time and different sources. The title itself is a misnomer because on page one, the first thing Hegel says about aesthetics is how hard it is to say what aesthetics is really about. He said the word aesthetics is not satisfactory. Why not? Well, if you go to your dentist and she says, there's a little problem here. I, I noticed a little sign here, which made me think of this part of what I'm saying. What, what, what does that mean? The dentist means you have a problem, she's going to drill one of your teeth. And what happens before that? She gets out that needle, looks like it's going to go through the back of your skull, and what's in that needle? It's an anesthetic. That means no feeling. From the Greek word esthesis, meaning perception or sensation. So obviously that is not what this book is about. It's not about sensation. Hegel says the proper expression for our science is philosophy of art, or more definitely, the philosophy of fine art. So not only is he not talking about mere sensation, he's also not talking about just art either, which could mean applied art, industrial art, craft, but rather fine art, in German, schöne Kunst, meaning pretty art, beautiful art, or what we call fine art. So the proper title for this work should be Hegel's Lectures on the Philosophy of Fine Art. Uh, they decided to go with two words, though. Hegel's aesthetics. And this particular text was cobbled together from many different sources, starting with Hegel's own lecture notes from the various years he taught the course in Heidelberg and Berlin. Then there are the changes and additions he made 
to those lectures over the years. Of course, he had no word processor. So after his death, everything was handed over to an editor, who fortunately, in this case, was an art historian and former student of Hegel's named Heinrich Hotho. In his introduction to the finished book, Hotho wrote, how Hegel himself, standing there on the podium in the full flow of a lecture, was able to navigate his way through these books with their laconic keywords, their confusing mass of years' worth of chaotic notes, is barely fathomable. That was the material he was given to work with. To this was added, and I think this is the most unusual component of the Hegel literature, student transcripts of Hegel lectures. These were necessary because Hegel didn't see his job as a lecturer as just walking into a room and reading off a piece of paper, as I'm doing here. He, of course, did have his chaotic notes, but he used them not as a script, but as the inspiration for a creative and improvisational dialogue with himself and with the subject matter. Here's a description of Hegel at the podium, as remembered by one of his students. Entirely lost in his subject, he seemed to develop it out of itself for its own sake, and scarcely at all for the sake of his hearers. Stammering already at the beginning, he forced his way on, would make a new beginning, then again stop short, speak, then meditate, the exact word ever in request, and just then it would come with infallible certainty. Now one felt one had grasped a proposition and expected a further advance to be made, yet in vain, for the thought, instead of advancing, kept turning with similar words again and again round the same point. Even one who could follow with full insight and intelligence saw himself thrown into the strangest tension and agony of mind. To such depths was thought carried down, to such infinite oppositions was it torn asunder, so that all that had been won seemed ever again to be lost. But it was just in these depths of the apparently undecipherable that Hegel lived and moved with the greatest certainty and calm. Then his voice would rise, his eyes lighted with the flame of conviction, while in words that now flowed without hesitation, he measured the heights and depths of the soul. What he uttered in such moments was so clear and of such simple self-evident power that everyone who could grasp it felt as if he had found and thought it for himself. And so completely did all previous ways of thinking vanish that scarce a remembrance remained of the days of dreaming in which such thoughts had not yet been awakened. This kind of performance, and I think we can call it that, is what Hegel saw as his real work as a philosopher. Rather than sitting in private, filling journals like Kierkegaard or writing books like Nietzsche, but lecturing, discovering, discoursing, exemplifying the development of thought in the moment. And it is that which his editors, the friends of the departed, have tried to reconstruct in the various editions of Hegel's complete works. Lectures on aesthetics, the philosophy of religion, the philosophy of history, the history of philosophy, books that are two, three, four volumes each. Admittedly, they can be intimidating. Originally, when my research supervisor suggested Hegel, my first reaction was, absolutely not. Hegel has that kind of reputation. It makes people wary. It also makes them lazy. They admit they can't ignore him, but when they look for a point of entry, what do they find? Often, it's the aforementioned Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in outline. In outline, that's in the title of the book. But that book is three volumes long. So I can understand the desire for a workaround, for something more manageable, a, a very short introduction to Hegel, as one book available today is called, or another I saw called Hegel in 90 Minutes, which suggests that studying Hegel is something that could be done in about the time it would take to bake a cake, a book of fewer than 100 pages, which presumably one could read in the time it took to have lunch with Hegel himself with similar, similar results, I would expect. This simultaneous curiosity to know about Hegel but lack of commitment to engage with his thought has resulted in making him arguably the most famous unknown philosopher in the world, meaning that like, say, Fichte or Kassir, Hegel's name is well known both inside and to some extent outside of academic philosophy. Yet the difference between the Hegel presented in so many of the books written about him and the Hegel who emerges from his own words could hardly be more dramatic. The editor of the most recent edition of Hegel's political textbook, The Philosophy of Right, wrote an introduction to that book in which he says that the discrepancy can easily be accounted for by the fact that Hegel is cited more frequently than he is read 
and discussed far oftener than he has understood. Some of those who discourse on Hegel with the greatest sophistication know him only through warped, inaccurate, or boulderized secondhand accounts. For instance, accounts of the Hegelian dialectic as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The Hegelian ideas which capture the popular imagination are often not present in Hegel at all, or have only the most tenuous and dubious connection with what Hegel actually thought or wrote. Reading that was so meaningful to me as a student because while I was researching Hegel by actually reading what he said, I made what I later realized was the mistake of reading Hegel commentaries at the same time. I was learning firsthand just how wide the discrepancy was between reading Hegel and reading about Hegel. It isn't the same, the same person at all. The example mentioned in that quotation perfectly illustrates this point, since almost everyone who has heard anything about Hegel has heard that the most important thing about his philosophy is its three-part structure, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Uh, how, how many here have heard this about Hegel? That his philosophy is based on this, on this model. Unfortunately, it is not the most important thing about his philosophy. In fact, this may come as a shock, it has nothing to do with Hegel. You've heard the phrase, you can't prove a negative. Well, that's because usually you can't. The Loch Ness Monster, could you prove that it exists? Uh, yes, you could. It could be captured, it could be photographed, you could see it in National Geographic. That would constitute some evidence that it's really there, though I doubt we're likely to see that anytime soon. Conversely, since we can't irrefutably prove that the Loch Ness Monster does not exist, short of draining Loch Ness, Some people are always going to believe in it. And the same is true of Bigfoot, aliens, astrology, the jolly green giant, whatever it is that people believe in. Proving a negative is very difficult. But in this case, in Hegel's case, we actually can prove a negative. How? It's kind of like draining Loch Ness. We can read all of Hegel's texts. We can look in their indices. We can scan them in Google Books. And you know what it turns up? Nothing. Well, almost nothing. I, I have to say almost because in an older version of Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy, he makes a reference to Kant using a thesis, antithesis, synthesis argument. But I think even that was inaccurate since in Kant there is a thesis. You'll see in Kant a thesis and an antithesis in, in columns side by side which say opposite things but each is logically true and therefore contradictory. So there is no third column. There is no synthesis in that sense in Kant. In any event, Hegel wasn't talking about his own philosophy, and the re that reference has actually been removed from the most recent edition of the history of philosophy. So if there is no evidence for the thesis, antithesis, synthesis in Hegel's philosophy, much less that it constitutes its core or foundation, why do people believe it? Why does it say in Hegel in 90 Minutes for example, that the most vital element of Hegel's system was the dialectic of the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Well, why does anyone believe in the Loch Ness Monster? Whether it exists or not, or whether it even could exist, doesn't really seem to make any difference. People just want to believe in it. They want to believe that something like that is possible. Hegel has a certain reputation. He's supposed to be very difficult to read, hard to understand, a nice positive thesis opposed by a nasty negative antithesis, yet which resolves in a comforting synthesis seems to make sense. It's easy to understand. It's even aesthetically pleasing in its representation of tension and resolution. Yet let us not forget it is also totally false. So I have to conclude that the reason, the reason people hold on to it is simply that they want to. It can only be the desire to embrace a simple formula which is supposed to be the key of a complex and sophisticated philosophy. And it's a lot easier to believe that than to read several hundred pages of Hegel. After all, why bother when Hegel in 90 minutes offers a concise, expert account of Hegel's life and ideas in only 80 pages, according to the publisher? I actually expected better from Wikipedia when I looked to see what was on there. But unfortunately, it has been polluted as well. But that's a whole story in itself. Let's go back to Hegel's aesthetics. Like pretty much everything else for Hegel, it has a three-part structure, though obviously not thesis and it is a synthesis. If we step back, step back and look at Hegel's philosophy as a whole, predictably, it also has a three-part structure, logic or thought, 
nature, which is the world, and something that's more ambiguous. In German, it's called Geist, which means mind or spirit. This third part, the philosophy of mind, is divided again into three sections, subjective mind, objective mind, absolute mind. Absolute mind is where I spent most of my time as a Hegel researcher, because absolute mind itself has three subdivisions, which are art, religion, and philosophy. So I spent a few years in the first of those, art, which also has three sections, which are roughly historical, being symbolic art, classical art, and romantic art. To give an example of how useless the thesis antithesis synthesis formula is, we just need to see how it doesn't work in this case. Symbolic art is not a thesis, and classic art is not an antithesis, and the two are not synthesized in romantic art. If any of these is a synthesis, in fact, it would actually be classic art, in which the form and content, which all art have, has, are perfectly matched to each other and exemplify what Hegel calls the ideal. So if we were looking for some kind of synthesis in this group, it actually occurs in the middle. Now that gives you some idea, though not one that's easy to follow, I'm sure, of what's happening in Hegel's aesthetics. But to most people, these lectures are famous above all for only one thing, the end of art. My doctoral dissertation, in fact, was titled Hegel's Aesthetics and the End of Art. Based on the pattern you've seen developing here, however, what do you think the chances are that Hegel actually talks about anything that could be labeled the end of art? Of course, if it's supposed to be the core, the foundation, the most important thing in Hegel, you can be pretty sure it's something he doesn't discuss at all. According to one commentator, Hegel's philosophy entails the negation of the very idea of art, so that in art, in it, art is in fact sentenced to death. This apocalyptic view is theatrically presented by the otherwise respectable Italian philosopher and historian Benedetto Croce. He describes Hegel's aesthetics as art's funeral oration. This is a quote from Croce. He passes in review the successive forms of art, the symbolic, the classical, the romantic, shows the progressive steps of internal consumption and lays the whole in its grave, leaving philosophy to write its epitaph. In this way, Croce says, The German proclaimed the the mortality, nay, the very death of art. He says, for Hegel, art must disappear because it is superfluous. Art must die and indeed is already quite dead. Now, if you've read even a little bit of Nietzsche, you've probably come across him saying that God is dead. But you can read all 1,300 pages of Hegel's aesthetics and not read about the death of art. You'll notice Croce didn't actually employ any quotations from Hegel. That is, he didn't introduce any evidence for his funeral oration claims. This, of course, is because there isn't any. Hegel very rarely makes claims about the future of anything. In fact, his most famous line, which comes from the philosophy of right, is that the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. A beautiful image, which means that it is philosophy's job to come on the scene at the end of the day and reflect on the meaning of what is past, not to speculate upon what may or may not happen in the future. Prophecy, Hegel says, is not the business of the philosopher. One thing he does say about the future of art, though, is that we may well hope that art will always rise higher and come to perfection. I don't know exactly what that means, but it certainly doesn't sound like a death sentence to me. How can we account for what we can only describe as a mass hallucination? As we saw before, I think it's because people want to believe that a massive text, like Hegel's aesthetics, is somehow disposable, not worth the effort to work our way into, that its essence can somehow be captured in a bumper sticker-like soundbite phrase, Hegel's aesthetics, death of art. I think this is for two reasons. People are lazy. I know I was. And then there's Hegel's reputation, which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my first reaction was, was no way. Uh, Would you like to hear the opinion of Arthur Schopenhauer? Hegel's intellectual and professional rival. This isn't something he said. It's something he actually wrote in his major work, The World as Will and Representation. The greatest effrontery in serving up sheer nonsense, in scrabbling together senseless and maddening webs of words such as had previously been heard only in madhouses, finally appeared in Hegel. It became the instrument of the most ponderous and general mystification that has ever existed, 
with a result that will seem incredible to posterity and will remain a lasting monument to German stupidity. No fan of Hegel there. To close with a contrasting opinion, I present the thoughts of Malcolm Knox, whose opinion I think counts for something. He translated many works of Hegel, including this edition of his aesthetics. So I would say he knows Hegel better than most. In fact, Knox revealed at a conference once that in the course of translating Hegel's lectures on art, he read them in their entirety seven times. He said, the common idea that Hegel's is a philosophy of exceptional difficulty is quite mistaken. Once his terminology is understood and his main principles grasped, he presents far less difficulty than Kant, for example. One reason for this is a certain air of dogmatism in Kant. His statements are often hedged around with qualifications, while Hegel had, as it were, seen a vision of absolute truth, and he expounds it clearly and with confidence. I hope you can see past the myths and the pollution, the laziness, the bad scholarship, and that maybe you will be inspired to get to know something of the real Hegel. He's out there. His thought is still with us, and it has been my privilege to be able to become acquainted with some part of his philosophy. I hope I've been able to share some of that with you. Thank you. I think we'll start with a few questions, if, if anyone has any. Are we here? Well, I've heard that he said that the, the synthesis is kind of a misrepresentation, but only in the sense that he does have this concept of top table, which is translated incorrectly as synthesis, and I forget the other words. Sublation is true, yeah. yes. So could you kind of explain the difference between our table and synthesis and, and how, why it got, what, how it got wrong by the popular I th Well, because everything in Hegel has a three-part structure. So they just, the, the idea is that everything is a, can be seen as a thesis and an antithesis and then something that comes after that which somehow synthesizes, mixes those two together, resolves them. But... In most cases, or, or many cases anyway, if you look at the, the three-part structure, the first two parts are not actually in an opposition. Uh, there was one, there's actually a book that came out last year called Hegel's Undiscovered Thesis, Antithesis, Synthesis, Dialectic. Whole, this book is over 400 pages trying to reclaim this idea, the thesis, antithesis. And one of his examples is the, the master-slave dialectic. If you've read uh, uh, Phenomenology of Mind, or you know anything about it, this is very influential on Karl Marx. This, this occurs in Hegel's first book. And uh, this more recent book says that in it we can see the slave as the thesis. The master is the antithesis. And the, a free man would, be, would somehow synthesize these. But when I thought about this, I thought, this, if the slave is the thesis, what would be the opposite of that? I, presumably it would be not being a slave. Or... The, the, the opposite is presented in the dialectic or in this, in this model as being the slaveholder. And I thought, well, the opposite of being a slaveholder would probably be someone who doesn't hold slaves or someone who's an abolitionist. So there's no real, if you try to force it into that model, it doesn't really work. But are you saying, like, when people criticize Hegelian Marxism, they hate Hegel for kind of compromising Marxist commitment to materialism, right? Because it's, like, it's idealism, right? This guy's just Geschichte. So you're saying he doesn't have. Hegel doesn't have a notion of a movement of history that's dialectical, that somehow Marx totally mystified that idea by taking it over? The, well, the, the funny thing about Karl Marx is that he said, I, I think it, it says on his grave in London, that the philosophers of the past, actually it says workers of all, all, all lands, every, uh, workers of all lands unite. But a very famous phrase from Marx is that the philosophers of the past have only interpreted history, the point is to change it. And he said that to do that he was going to take Hegel's philosophy and turn it on its head. But the interesting thing about Hegel's philosophy is that it is described as having the form of a circle. So if you try to invert a circle, it's still the right way up, right? It, it doesn't, doesn't turn over. And Karl Marx, I mean, you said something like Hegel somehow uh, compromises Marx. I mean, you know, well, Hegel's an idealist. Marx was trying to be a materialist, but he also seemed to cling to a dialectical notion of history based on Hegel's own. Hegel definitely thinks... Well, no. I mean, Hegel definitely thinks there is progression in history. He regards the history of the world as a rational process. Karl Marx interprets that as a, as a process of class struggle. rather than For Hegel, it's a philosophical process of coming to higher and higher levels of truth. While for Marx, it's a conflict between different classes until classes are 
uh, until classes no longer exist. Like he would see that as a as a, a synthesis of of the conflict that he sees in world history. Uh, I believe Martin Luther King actually said in a speech that Marx didn't read Hegel enough. Uh, if that's true, I, I'd like to see that reference. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll try to find it. But um, the, the idea being that that Marx wasn't idealistic enough, and it, it should have been more Hegelian than reading. But actually, you know, I would in a, in a if, if this had been a longer lecture, I would have mentioned Marx because where uh, a good question would be where does this idea of the thesis, the antithesis, where does this come from? And is believed to have been popularized by Karl Marx in his book, The Poverty of Philosophy, which was a you know the idea being that philosophy isn't strong enough or isn't doing enough, and that was a response to Proudhon, who had written a book called The Philosophy of Poverty. But this book remained out of print for a long time. But in it, and I, I did look it up. He does specifically attribute to, to Hegel this, this structure, which isn't there. Again, it's like these other books that, that say it's in there, but they, can, they do it without references because the references don't exist. So it's a, essentially it's a, a misinterpretation of Hegel. But, but, but are you saying that Hegel is not a transcendental idealist in his vision of history? That there is a sort of pattern of history that's sort of transcendental? Uh, no, it, he's. I mean, he thinks that something is happening in world history, but it's not something that transcends the people involved in that. Right? I mean, is that what you're... Because a lot of people... That's another myth about Hegel, that the world spirit, the Weltgeist, that it exists independently of the world, and somehow we're all pawns of the cunning of reason. Uh, I, again, I find this... An, uh, I don't see the evidence for, for believing what, that. Then what is the Geist that we're talking about? The Geist? It, well, what if we just talk about the, uh, the spirit of 76, you know, or the, the, the American spirit? I mean, do we, do we believe that that exists independently of all the people in the country, or some kind of American point of view or whatever. I, I don't think anyone else would believe that, but that's what people believe about Hegel. It's like a zeitgeist more than a... You, you could, that's, that's not a Hegelian term, but I, I guess you could see it in that way. But it's certainly not an independent entity. You know, the, a lot of people think that there is an ontological status that Hegel uh, attributes to the world spirit or the spirit of the age or, or whatever, one of the various phrases he uses, but I, I don't see it there. I don't think it's accurate. Let's, let's take another one. Uh, uh, I don't know why my emotional reaction is that I've just received a rather disturbing message that scholarship on Hegel, since Hegel, is a complete failure and I can't go ahead. It's not a complete failure. Uh, that I can't go to any texts on Hegel that, that represents the kind of truth you're presenting. It seems to be me, you're, you're describing a world that wants to know Hegel, must come to someone like you, or read Hegel, and that's the only option. It is. Now, along this line, what I'm thinking is, okay, you're talking about a, a, a certain systematic approach to understanding Hegel by reading him. And I'm thinking about this issue of, like, a meta-message or underlying meaning. It doesn't a lot... Like there are these idea movements in history. You think of the history of ideas. Couldn't a scholar say that underlying Hegel's text and and uh, other information we might have about Hegel that that somehow Hegel's meanings are not? It's it's like the Bible. The difference between being literal and and uh, and going into it. Can a scholar argue that? Hegel was really saying something other than what he was saying, what he's written. Of course, Hegel existed. It. To be rich as a scholar doesn't one have to be capable of doing it. Of course, but, but that is only after a point of view from which you actually understand Hegel, or you've actually read him. Well, no. And most people, I think... No, I mean, it, it's all about understanding Hegel. Right? right, but you can't... Right. My point is you can't understand him without reading him. I, I don't think that's controversial. And then if you want to say something further about his context or the larger spirit of an age or something, that's, that's perfectly legitimate. I'm not trying to shut that down. I'm just saying you have to start by actually reading Hegel. You have to start by unlearning. I read this uh, in one, one of the better books about Hegel. He says that he starts his students, this is Robert Solomon, and he wrote a book called In the Spirit of Hegel, and he says he starts his students by, t by making them unlearn everything they've heard about Hegel. If they've heard about the thesis, and this, just forget it. It's like you're in a courtroom and they say you must, this, this is not admissible because it's not there. There's no textual evidence for that. If you've heard anything else, if you've heard about the death of art, if you've heard about the world spirit, all these things, you have to forget about them because they did not come from Hegel's texts. They came from what I would characterize as bad scholarship. 
Back here, yes. So, Marx obviously was a critter that had political aims and has become quite uh, leveraged in politics. Just to bring aside, I don't want to, I, I want to hear what you have to say, but I was in Brazil right after the military government was replaced by a civilian government on a Henry Street corner and there was Marx and Lenin, you know, on the book stands because they were available. I'm curious, in your, in your scholarship and reading, to what extent you would say Hegel, based upon the political ideologies of those who didn't present them for the environments which were supporting them. In other words, is the representation of Hegel largely driven by this, the various political viewpoints and the ongoing conflict for most of the 20th century between communism and capitalism? Maybe. I mean, it's just, it's a Marxist interpretation of Hegel. It's not Hegel. I mean, very few people... I believe Karl Marx was a young Hegelian. He went to the University of Berlin only five years after Hegel's death. So he knew people who had been Hegel students. He was a member of, of the, the group of young Hegelians. He even ended up becoming a left Hegelian. But all of those people, you know, the, 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 the hardcore extremist conservatives, the hardcore leftist radicals, they, were, they all claimed to be Hegelians of some kind, the young Hegelians, the left Hegelians, the right Hegelians. But th those are all interpretations of Hegel. No one... Or almost no one, if, if you're a Marxist, you don't, very few people go back and read the original Hegel. Uh, Lenin did. Lenin actually made it, there's a whole book by Lenin that was a study of Hegel's science of logic, his largest book, a book entirely about logic. And Lenin thought this was important for, for communism, for Marxist Leninism, which I think is interesting. But very few people are going to go back and read uh, the science of logic or, or Hegel's lectures on history of philosophy, philosophy of history. Uh, they're just going to look at what Karl Marx said about it, which was that it had a, a thesis antithesis. Uh, structure and that that could be applied in a, in a political way. Sort of follows. I hear the word dialectic bandied about, and you hear a lot of like, travel in Eastern Europe, dialectic materialism, and things like that. Could you, could you kind of help me out with the definition of what really is, what dialectic means and how it applies? That, that is the academic name of Marxism. It's, it's not called Marxism, it's called dialectical materialism or historical materialism. And Karl Marx it takes it, presumably Lenin as well, Lenin takes it from. Um, from the science of logic, which really is just how logic works. Uh, and I didn't get into that because that's... I, actually, I suggested to Jersey that I come back and do another talk just on Hegel's dialectic, which would be about logic and phenomenology. Uh, so I'm probably not going to get into that. But the, the idea is that it's, not, it's often described as a dialectical method, and I think that's wrong. Because the way Hegel discuss, discusses it is that it's something that occurs in thought itself. It's not that he, as the dialectician, comes along and manipulates the material in a dialectical way. That, that is false. Uh, if you read um, just the opening, uh, the introduction to the, the science of logic, he talks about it there, with what must science begin is the name of that paper. And he talks about how you can't come and presuppose your subject matter. You can't manipulate it in your own way. He thinks that dialectic is something that occurs naturally in thought. And that's where his logic comes from. It's very different from any kind of formal or symbolic logic that, that you might see elsewhere. You mentioned Erwin, the Knox quote. You, uh, you read that if uh, Knox claimed that if we understood some of his concepts in terminology, a few, he said, a few of his concepts in terminology would all be much easier going. It um, is, yeah. Can you list like one, two, or three of the most important? There's Geist. Geist is probably the most important. That's in the title of his first book, The Phenomenology. Of, I mean, it's got two different translations, Phenomenology of Mind, Phenomenology of, of Spirit. So to understand what that interrelation is, and, and in my writing about Hegel, I actually say I can't get rid of one. You know, we'd like to dump one and just and, and use the other, but I actually use both, and you have to be, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a specialized term. So when is Hegel talking about something, when the, an individual mind? You're going to talk about mind. If he's talking about something larger, not, not an independent existing larger mind, but, but a, what you might call you know, a spirit of an age or something, then I would, as we say, we say spirit of the age. We don't say mind of the age. So Geist is very important. Uh, I, would look, uh, I would look at contradiction, dialectic, this, this kind of thing in, in the logic. Uh, ab absolute idea concept, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of terms in, in Hegel, but the, the most important is definitely the, the, uh, the Geist one. What do you think motivated Schopenhauer's uh, uh, slander? Is there any... Well, one, what, he's a... Con the 
Um, it's very consistent. You know, if you read Schopenhauer, there often he just comes right out, says what he thinks about Hegel. Uh, he was a very different thinker. You know, he was uh, locked in a in a Kantian mind frame, which is which at that time was 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 actually uh, uh, you know what we call today retro. You know, those kind of the old school kind of thing. He didn't want to deviate from Immanuel Kant, and uh, I think he there was a lot of professional jealousy as well. Hegel had died prematurely. Uh, Schopenhauer lived on many, many years. I mean, when, when he said what I quoted, that was in the eight, about 1860, which was 30 years after Hegel's death. I mean, it's like the, it's like the film Amadeus, right, where, where Salieri is still alive and, and, no, and everyone's forgotten him. Uh, Schopenhauer, uh, he was well-read, but he certainly never, he, a man who had been dead for 30 years was still more popular. He says that, and we are told this is the most famous philosopher in the world. And there was also a, an ind- individual professional rivalry, rivalry between them because of uh, some, there's some little anecdote about them uh, Schopenhauer arranging his lectures at the same time as Hegel trying to steal a student, something like that. You know, the, I, I think there's a little intrigue in there. Premature death has always been a pretty good career choice. For I guess. I mean, uh, one, th- one, thing I, one thing I almost quoted was some, some, thing, some remarks made at Hegel's uh, funeral. And they said, uh, his students said that uh, they tried to see it as a good thing. You know, made the best out of the situation. They said that they were emancipated from the empirical Hegel, that now his ideas could spread uh, with, without, uh, without interruption. And I, I quoted this kind of negatively saying, you know, be careful what you wish for, because now there are so many Hegels. There's been a proliferation of Hegels, the left Hegelians, the right Hegelians, uh, that it might have been better if Hegel had lived a little bit longer to, to edit things like this, where you, you have multi-volume works made up of, of student transcripts and lectures that are given 20 years apart. It's, uh, you know, it, it's good that we have, have all this text, but it would have been better if it had been edited by Hegel himself. Yeah. Okay, one more. Yeah. Um, so I understand where you're coming from, where um, you're giving an explanation for people having a misinterpretation because they don't actually like to sit down and read him. It's very, um, the reputation's really uh, off-putting. Um, but it seems like that claim is something that could be applied to like, a lot of philosophers that are really difficult, like daunting test to, text to approach, and you mentioned Kant. Um, so it just seems like that maybe, like the reason for why people don't want to read him may not be unique to that case. Maybe, but I, I've heard it said that you can pick up a book by Kant, and you, there, there are actually some small books by Kant, there are no small books by Hegel, uh, and you can, you can read a few pages and you can get the general idea of what he's talking about. It's, it's moral philosophy, it's, it's metaphysics, it's something. Um, but I've heard other people say that they could read pages and pages of Hegel and have no idea what he's talking about. And that's true. If you're reading the science of logic, that's probably true. Uh, other things, I think it's usually, you wouldn't be that lost in Hegel. But I think it's the size of his works. As I said, that uh, since he had only published two himself, the rest are all these lecture courses. And they are many, many volumes. It's hundreds and hundreds. Of, you want to know Hegel's philosophy of religion? There's no little, you know, 100-page book on that. It's a three-volume book. And a lot, another thing is that a lot of people take the introductions. You'll often see the introductions to his lectures published separately. There are little tiny books, but they're just something that's been sawed off. So what Hegel was actually going to say is left out. You know, the three volumes that come after that introduction are gone. So a lot of people read only a 50 page, 40, 50 page introduction, and then they wonder, they wonder why they can't understand it. And they also, another problem is that they'll read what they think is the most concrete entry to Hegel, like his philosophy of history, the part that influenced Karl Marx so much. But to understand Hegel's philosophy of history, you would have to know his science of logic, his, his phenomenology of mind, before you could understand the, the speculative content, the philosophical content. Why is he talking about philosophy, uh, talking about history in a philosophical way? It presupposes that understanding of logic and phenomenology. But of course, if, if you're just reading that little introduction, you're not going to know that either, and you'll wonder why it isn't making any sense. So, you know, is there any... Any advice that I have for someone approaching Hegel, it's just to, to start reading it. I mean, to start reading the, insight, the uh, phenomenology, to look at the science of logic, and to avoid the commentaries. So uh, you described Hegel as this, this chaotic, blinding kind of mind, and it kind of reminds me, well, it's a crazy person, and maybe we need a crazy person to sort Hegel out. Another person. <laughs> and I'm thinking of Zizek and his intention. I don't know if it's published or not. He, he is or has written a book on Hegel. And Zizek is also insane. He's this rambling Slovenian idiot who I love. And, but there's actually really good stuff in there. And I'm thinking maybe if someone did want to read, of course, after reading Hegel's actual work, 
something by an insane person on Hegel, do you think maybe that would make it make sense? Well, I don't, I don't hate all commentators. I mean, I certainly didn't, you know, teach myself Hegel. I, I did have to have some, some models. And I, something I, you could recommend? Heidegger's lectures on the phenomenology of spirit okay. uh, changed my life. I mean, I, I, I'm like, wow, because Heidegger talks in little sentences. It's almost like baby talk. And, and when I was reading that, I felt like I was getting an X-ray of the phenomenology of mind. It was really well done. Uh, this book I mentioned by Robert Solomon. I think there's someone who really understands Hegel in his context. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, you know, Hegel's Hegel's own works, a few a few uh, books by a few commenta- commentaries by other people. Uh, I'll, you know, afterwards I'll, I'll look and maybe think of some others for you too.